All right, so um, unfortunately Chris Aramson can't make it today, so I thought we'd do something a little different. Um, and so instead of talking about technical topics, kind of talk about the backstories, how some papers came about, which if you're a PhD student or undergrad researcher could be quite relevant because often you know, distinction between successful research and unsuccessful research is not so much whether you understand the math, though it definitely matters, but most people do understand the math, do know how to implement, but then how do you actually work in the right problems and get things to come together uh, on a topic that people might actually care about. And so what I thought we'd do is um, step through some of the papers, and of course citation counts are not necessarily the like, perfect metric for which papers are more important or less important, but um, it's at least a metric that's somewhat approximate in terms of um, how much maybe other people at least cared about the research after you completed it. And so we could step through, um, we could step through um, some of the papers here that I'm familiar with the backstory about because the ones I know are the ones I was involved in. And I can tell you how they came together and maybe that can help you think through how your own work might come together in the future. So I thought I'd start with the um, trust vision policy optimization one, um, which is second on the list. Um, so how did that come together? So actually, this is, the paper is published in 2015, but it really started in 2012-13. Um, and John Schulman, the lead PhD student on that project, was actually working on this problem here. So he was working on how to make robots learn from demonstrations. And he actually came up with a method that allows a robot to um, be taught from just one demonstration how to tie a new knot from a somewhat arbitrary starting configuration. So this is a demonstration and this specific type of knot. And then now the rope is laid out differently and it actually, the, the system finds a non-rigid transformation between the situation in the demonstration and the currently encountered situation and then not only transforms the rope between situations, but also transforms the motions that were executed accordingly by extrapolating into 3D space. And then we get an execution based on that, and it actually can tie a wide range of knots just from a single demonstration. Now, John was working on that. Then in parallel, or kind of around the same time, this is 2012, ACRAD 2012, ACRAD, one of the main robotics uh, conferences, um, they had something called Sushi Challenge. And in this Sushi Challenge, the idea was that your robot is supposed to manage a sushi restaurant and kind of set the table and things like that. And I just Googled for this video, this, this was not our entry, this is uh, I think the Brown uh, or Team World uh, entry, I think it's Brown and KU Leuven who did this. And this robot's supposed to kind of pick things up, put them on shelves, take things from, from the shelf onto the table, and so forth. And as John was working on the sushi challenge, and we actually did, he did quite well, um, but it wasn't perfect. The knot tying worked really well, very reliable, but still far from perfect. He felt like the amount of time spent. I am Andy Oops. Stone, a mechanical engineering student. Not sure how to shut that stuff. up. This is the shoe tying <laughs> automatic robot for Star for sure. Okay. <laughs> um, so, this, while working on these challenges, he realized that to fix up the mistakes, it was always a lot of work. And then after he fixed up some mistakes by thinking through what could be done differently, it would make another mistake later and again work to fix it up. And it just felt like a never ending game of fixing things up by hard coding them, um, that maybe um, there should be a better way to do it. And so even though in my lab we have worked a lot on reinforcement learning, um, actually around 2010, 11, 12, we were working less on reinforcement learning, much more on learning from demonstrations. And John essentially said, you know, let's revisit reinforcement learning. I know it didn't really, you know, fully work the way we wanted to, but ultimately it seems like we need something like that to get reliable systems without it, it's not gonna be fully reliable. 
And so you need a self-improving system that can just keep getting better over time. That was kind of the starting point. Um, then um, what happened around the same time, going back to the paper, um, what happened around the same time, this is a paper we're discussing, um, is that um, Alex Krzyzewski, Elias Skiver, and Jeff Hinton, in, also in 2012, showed that you can actually train a neural network to reliably, somewhat reliably, recognize what's in an image. Um, with the ImageNet challenge where they had a big breakthrough. And so our thinking was, well, maybe image recognition used to not work very well, but with a deep neural network it starts working. Reinforcement learning used to work not very well, but maybe the reason it didn't work well was not the algorithms, maybe it was the representation. Maybe by us relying on a weighted sum of hand-designed features, we can just not succeed. We need something else and a way that some of hand design features, and maybe deep neural nets can give that to us. And we thought about it a little more, and we said, well, I mean, look at what's happening in most of kind of classical control theory. And a good example was Claire Tomlin's lab at the time. Hybrid control is very popular. It's definitely very popular at the time. What's hybrid control? You say linear control as we know how to do, but linear everywhere doesn't work. But what if we partition the space, and different parts of the space have a different linear controller? then it can work. And hybrid control will hand design the partitioning of the space. And we said, well, in some sense, that's what a neural net can do. If you have a neural net with rectified linear units, you're effectively, in the first sequence of layers, finding uh, partitioning of the space. And at the very end, you apply a linear controller in that region of the space. That's effectively what's happening. So maybe if we run reinforcement learning to train deep neural nets with rectified linear units, then we'll actually get the notion of hybrid control, but fully learned, so we get the expressiveness that we want. And it's even more expressive, because hybrid control tends to actually partition. But a neural net doesn't partition the space. It has much more gradual transitions from one region to the next. It's just along one dimension that's not even axis aligned, one dimension that the controller will change. So it's like a rank one update to your feedback matrix, rather than a full new feedback matrix that's happening as you cross a boundary. So John started working on this, but keep in mind at the time RL just didn't really work. So John decided to try to really understand it and he worked on pendulum. One degree of, one degree of freedom, pendulum, for almost a year. Just RL for pendulum. And again, right now this might seem crazy, but at the time RL was just not reliable. People actually, he went to a machine learning conference, RL was in like some separate room poster session with only a small number of posters, and most people wouldn't visit that room. That's, that was the state of affairs in machine learning, whereas now you go to machine learning conference, RL is everywhere. It's like maybe half the stuff is RL. But back then, it was like a small fraction, and it was usually tucked away in a place that people don't have to see it. That's changed, obviously, but at the time, it didn't work. Child was like, OK, let's get it to work on pendulum and really understand how to get that to work. Spent almost a year on that pendulum and cart pole. Finally got it working there. Um, how did it get it working? Essentially, it's like, OK, well, while he was doing that, in parallel, DeepMind was working on the Atari games. John was working on Pendulum. And in December 2013, then DeepMind released the result on DQN can learn to play Atari games. And John was still pushing Pendulum. A lot of people tried to reproduce the Atari game results. And it took forever before anybody was able to reproduce the DQN results. It was like a major tour de force if you somehow managed to reproduce those results. It was very hard to do. It was clear that you know, Vlad Mi at DeepMind, who did, you know, was the lead on that project, clearly had a lot of trickery up in his head that couldn't make it work, but that the rest of the world had not figured out at all yet. In parallel, John was essentially figuring out the same things at Berkeley independently. And then what happened is, as we tried to also reproduce DQN, essentially what we concluded is, well, um, the problem with DQN is that you're not really optimizing an objective. You're just optimizing this thing, this Bellman error thing, but then you have so the next Bellman error thing comes from the previous estimate of the Q function, and it's just like, it's a weird cyclic thing, and that's why it's probably very unstable. So we decided to fully focus on policy grade methods. Because of the policy grade method, you know at all times how well you're doing. 
Then we notice that even policy grain methods are not that stable, even on simple problems like it'll not always work if you just run a naive policy gradient. And so that's really where trust vision policy optimization came from. John decided that to actually make progress on this, we need an extremely stable optimization method for policy gradients. So change policy gradients to be much more stable than the standard vanilla policy gradient. And of course, John had already worked on uh, trajectory uh, trajectory optimization with trust regions and so forth, and he knew from there that one way to stabilize optimization is to have trust regions. Because you have your current policy, and if you stay close enough to your current policy, then if you step in the right direction, then it should be an improvement. If you make a big step, it might not be an improvement anymore because the local approximation is not valid, but if you know which reason you can trust your grid, you should be good to go. And so that's really what he started focusing on, and TRPO, Trust Region Policy Position, became the first stable RL algorithm. At the time it came out, still DQN was very hard to get to work, and that's really where also its popularity came from, was that you could actually just run it and it would be stable and gradually improve performance. Um, there are downsides to it, like DQN is off policy, TRPO is on policy. If you care about sample complexity, DQN will, by design, pretty much outperform TRPO, but the real high level bit at the time was get something stable. Get something that you can just rely on, you can run it, and it'll gradually improve reward you collect. So that's how this paper came about. And I mean, of course, a big part of why it's highly cited is because it was the, the first one to do this. Um, it, so it matters a lot when you do things, if people are going to pay attention to it or not. Um, at the same time, John wasn't fully happy with it. So as he had finished TRPO, and of course, it starts working. And I think this is something you realize comes, recurs a lot. Like, you'll see a paper, and you'll like it, and a lot of people like it. And, you might project your liking of the paper onto the person who wrote the paper, believing that that's the way to go. Just like you might you know, think that, you know, Yanni Kuhn, Yosha, Benjo, Jeff Hinton, only, you know, this specific deep net they just did is the only way to go. No, usually people who originated it already know a lot more about the limitations than you think. And while everybody else is so excited to follow into those steps, they're already thinking about, okay, these are the limitations. What am I going to do next and moving on to the next thing? And so, from TRPO, which is still one of the most stable algorithms out there, John's main reservation essentially was that it's not first order. When you run it, you need to do a second order calculation, which tends to be difficult to implement, and it also is not very scalable. Not very compatible with things like dropout, not very compatible with auxiliary losses. And so how can we get rid of that second order optimization? Of course, we saw in class PPO, and PPO is a result of John working for another year past this. Think about how do I make this first order so I can run it a lot more easily using off-the-shelf optimization algorithms like Atom RMS prop instead of a specifically designed optimization method. And so that's how, how this one came about. And another angle, I mean, that John wasn't very happy with, he felt like the signal the noise ratio still wasn't good in TRPO. Like it was improving gradually, but actually, and it was able to learn to play the Atari games. It was able to, um, I think it was the, there was the DeepMind paper in Atari games. There was a Michigan paper that was doing it with a little more to a kind of cloning type approach, and then Monte Carlo research and cloning. And then TRPO was the third paper overall that was consistently learning on the Atari games. It was also learning 2D locomotion, but it wasn't learning 3D locomotion. Higher dimensional problem, more noise, less signal, and so it wasn't learning very effectively. And so that's where John actually started thinking about generalized advantage estimation, which we covered in class, where he said, okay, you have the policy gradient part, but then there's the advantage function. And how do you estimate that more reliably than we've been estimating it so far? Monte Carlo is great because it's in the limit always precise, but it's very time consuming, high dimensional problems, not enough time to get enough data. And then he switched over to doing advantage estimation with reward plus discounted value, minus value, and that made all the difference to be able to go into 3D locomotion. 
So maybe let me pause here for questions on this one, and I'll, I'll switch to another one. Yes? Uh, does this paper relate to the approximately optimal paper by Kakad and Chan? Good question. So is this paper related to the approximately optimal? So there's a paper, I think it's called, well, I forgot what the title is, but essentially it says that you can provably make improvements with a, essentially a conservative version of policy iteration. Policy iteration completely updates the policy to the greedy one with respect to the current one step look ahead. But that's not great because that might be too big a step. And so what they looked at essentially is they said, okay, it's too big a step. What am I going to do? I'm going to mix the old policy with the new policy. So I'm interpolating by mixing, stochastically mixing. Of course, John read that paper. John read pretty much all the papers that existed in RL at the time. I mean, he had a whole year to really figure out what ideas actually help on a pendulum and a carpool, right? So he really carefully teased it all apart. And essentially, his conclusion was that that idea is key, but the keeping all past policies around and mixing them is just not practical. So you need to do the interpolation in neural net space. Like update your neural net gradually rather than having multiple policies you keep around. But very close connection, absolutely. Yes. Actually, let me see if the box is here. Is the box? I don't see it. Um, yeah, I'll repeat the question. When it comes to uh, these limitations, do you realize after you publish the paper, how much of it do you um, just leave for other people to figure out how much of it would you do it yourself? Yeah, that's a good question. After you write a paper, how much do you want to still do the next, 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 next paper? Or do you want to just move on to something else? I think it depends a lot on, um, it, it varies a lot. Sometimes you just write one paper and you move on to something else. Because um, you feel like, okay, you've made your contribution and it's exciting to do something new. Um, in this particular case, I mean, the excitement was that, okay, this is the first table algorithm, but it still wasn't getting at the harder problems we really wanted to solve. And we thought, I mean, at the time, there was a, maybe just a handful of people who really understood how to get DeepRL to work. And it was not something where if we just left it there, that a half year later it would work. Um, it would have been either, pretty much it would have been you know, one of just a handful of people who actually specifically pushes this direction. And we thought it was very worthwhile to kind of do the next thing, generalized advanced estimation, the next thing, PPO, to get this all the way. Yeah? Could you <clears throat> say a little more about the decision to switch from rope tying, like trying to tie the knots, to the decision to go into the pendulum and uh, on carpool? Like, what exactly? Because it seems like you're saying the, you, like, you have something that can work on a robot, but we have to hard code in a bunch of extra rules. It's not like a game that we never win, beating back into mm -hmm. extra rules. And then, we do have these general methods that can work uh, potentially in simulation and on a pendulum. And I'm mm -hmm. curious, it seems like there might be some trade-off in like at least when you're doing the ropes, you know that like, hey, we have this awesome demonstration where mm -hmm. we're showing a, a real robot tying a rope. Mm -hmm. Whereas when you make that tack change to the simulation, you don't necessarily know, like again, maybe it's a whole year of like, hey, what are you, what were you able to do? Oh, I was able to have a carpool and simulate. Like, like yeah, what's, what were, I guess, the I, guess just I feel like a few things were at play. So the, 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 just to repeat the question on, on Mike, essentially, what, what was that transition like? Like, what was the debate like? The transition from, we got something that can fairly reliably learn to tie knots on a real robot to we're spending a year on pendulum yeah. in simulation. Yeah, yeah. It seems like a real step back. Yeah. I think there were a few things at play. One is that the fundamental belief that we're not going to get there otherwise. That no matter what we do, ultimately we've got to figure out reinforcement learning properly to get reliable robot systems. That was the kind of starting observation that we just very strongly believed in and still believe in that. Without reliable RL, it's just not going to be able to self-improve and hence not going to be able to get to the levels that we wanted to get to. So that was one big thing. Not a big thing, it was a big risk, essentially. I mean, it could be that we spend the whole year on this. Keep in mind, at the time, there was, there was no, the DQN result didn't exist yet. I mean, there was literally, RL was still relegated to the side rooms in machine learning conferences that nobody visited, right? So it was a, it was a big bet. Um, I felt like part of why we could make the bet is because at the time, 
John had already done multiple major contributions worth of more than one PhD thesis. So he had done trash opt, which was the best motion plan at the time, maybe still now, optimization-based motion planning. He had done um, the learning from demonstrations for manipulation of deformable objects, which was a breakthrough in terms of dealing with deformable objects. And I feel like I'm blanking on, on the third thing somehow. But he had, I believe he had done three major, oh, he had done something uh, extremely innovative in tracking deformable objects. So she had come up with a way to, when you get a point cloud input, to leverage that to track the 3D shape of a deformable object by directly feeding what you see in the point cloud into an existing simulator of deformable objects. You can use off-the-shelf simulators. Normally when you build a common filter, you have to build a simulator yourself, right? Because the common filter embodies the simulator and the observation model. He had come up with a methodology to essentially allow the simulator to remain a black box, yet effectively run a particle filter or common, well, particle filter you can always do, but if we run a common filter around that could it reliably track uh, the shape, the current shape of a deformable object. It had three major breakthroughs already, so I felt like even if nothing came out of it, he already had done more than one PhD, and you know, it's just like, okay, this is clearly what's needed. Maybe now is the time, maybe not. But let's just try and see what happens. If it doesn't happen, it's not a problem. Like, his career is on track no matter what happens, so we can easily take the bet. Other questions on this one? So let me switch to another one then. Sometimes the stories are simpler. So this one here, I was just a first year PhD student uh, starting at Stanford and this new professor showed up, Andrew Ng, who I think many of you know, but back then not everybody knew him. I mean, he just started his first year, he just finished his PhD at Berkeley, moved to Stanford. And he showed up and he said, you know what? I think reinforcement learning is all good, but when you want to put it in practice, actually the bottleneck is often designing the reward function. Why don't we work on that? And I was like, that sounds kind of crazy because nobody else is really working on that. Who's going to pay attention to our work? Nobody seems to you know, pay attention to that. But Andrew's like, you know, think about it. This is only what people are going to need to do. Like, whenever RL works, the next step is to be good at reward engineering, and that's really hard. Why don't we already start thinking about it now? Because it is a big challenge, and see what we can figure out. And this was a space where there was already a paper Andrew had written together with Stuart Russell from Berkeley here during his PhD. And it, that kind of laid out the problem setting, but hadn't come up with a full algorithm yet. It had some suggestions for algorithms, but not a full algorithm that you could use to then learn from demonstrations. And so Andrew was like, that's the missing piece. I already wrote the paper with Stuart that kind of lays out the problem, but we need something that can actually learn from demonstrations, close the loop fully. And so this, I would say, was one of those things where it almost never happened when working on a paper like I work on it, and the idea is so clear, and then we run experiments and it just works. Because it's just like, okay, what are we supposed to do? We're supposed to recover a reward function from demonstrations. We know that demonstrations are supposed to be near optimal. It's a clear optimality criterion. And any guess of, the naive thing is you guess a reward function, or you might guess, you guess a reward function, you look how well the expert does against that reward function, you compare it with some other random policies, if the expert's better, that might have been a good guess. If the expert is worse, probably a bad guess. It's obviously not the algorithm we propose. We propose an optimization procedure that's more efficient. Just logically speaking, uh, it kind of felt like this couldn't go wrong. Like, there is a guarantee that you can formulate this problem and that you can optimize to back out. It's a min-max optimization effectively, but you can solve that to find the reward function. And that just didn't exist yet. And so it's like a very linear uh, path to, to getting the paper done. Um, that said, I mean, we submitted the paper. 
and it got rejected. I remember it was like my first paper, and it's like, oh my god, this is so sad. Like, I worked on this all year, and Andrew had been telling me, you know, this is the important thing, and the reviewers don't agree. This is the important thing. Yeah, they say, you know, they didn't care seemingly. And so it's like, okay, I went bowling. And <laughs> next day I come back and talk with Andrew, and I'm like, okay, uh, what are we gonna do? He says, you know, don't worry about it, you know? It's not what the reviewers think. You know, we, we have a clear view on this, and, and you know, we'll just resubmit, and you know, we'll pause the writing. You know, there's definitely places where we could have been clear, such that the reviewers would have gotten our idea more easily. And we'll do that, and when we get our idea across more clearly, hopefully you know, we'll have better luck. And I'll get in, and that's exactly what happened. But essentially, it was kind of a very interesting thing, because it was like so clear what to do, and then at the review time, it was just like, okay, reviewers are like, Oh no, not interesting, partially due to the writing, partially due to the fact that it was just not what people were working on. Like people were trying to improve reinforcement learning algorithms. They were not trying to take the next step of finding a reward function that you could use with your RL algorithm. And so a lot more explanation was needed to get, in some sense, the argument across why this matters. And just proposing an algorithm wasn't cutting it because people weren't really caring about that algorithm because they hadn't been made to understand why there's even a problem here that needed solving. Only once they understood that could they appreciate there was an algorithm that solved the problem. This is an example where we essentially we just we didn't write any follow-up papers on this, but there was a lot of follow-up papers. Like soon thereafter, there was a maximum entropy per version of this. There was a max margin version of this. Because essentially, in, whenever you do something like this, there's always variations you can do. Um, and improvements, um, but we actually just did this and then we started looking at dynamics model learning as the other bottleneck in RL rather than continuing to push this at the time. Let me pause here for this one, see if there are questions. Yeah? It seems like there aren't that many papers on inverse reinforcement learning, even though it tries to, uh, it aims to solve a pretty fundamental problem, you think? Mm -hmm. so quite, like, in some sense. Could you touch on why that is, maybe? Well, back then there was essentially no papers. Um, now there's a lot more, and I think the pickup is happening because, partially because RL is starting to work better. And the better it works, the more people try to make it solve problems and realize that reward engineering is a real thing. Um, in addition to that, there is a big like, push by, especially Stuart Russell, and Anka Dragan, both here at Berkeley, to think about human-compatible AI. How do you make your AI understand what a human wants? And ultimately, if you think about reinforcement as the formalism that AI is solving for optimizing some objective you care about, well, it better optimize the right objective. And so I would say in the last two years, there's been a big uptick in work in that space, not always called inverse RL. I mean, another thing, sometimes you, know, you need to give something a slightly different name to reflect both that it's slightly different direction and to make it more new to people who read it. Um, but it's essentially a lot of these ideas coming back and building on top of it. Like for example, a paper that's quite popular, um, uh, Dylan hatfield Minnell did, who's jointly advised by Stuart, Anka, and me, is cooperative inverse reinforcement learning, where you have a human in the loop with the robot or the agent, and together they're trying to optimize reward, and so the goal for the robot or the agent there is to optimize the reward that the human has. The human might give demonstrations, might give other information in principle, but the robot never has access to reward. So essentially the same thing. This is very much just demonstrations, bunch of demonstrations and done. That's interactive. How do you get the most? And how do you account for uncertainty that you might have about the actual reward function underneath? Yeah. Uh, you may have already answered this, but when the follow-up work, many, many follow-up work on this came up, do you feel like, oh, I should have done that? Or That's a good question. Do I, do I sometimes feel like, OK, this follow-up paper, I wish I had done it. Um, yeah, sometimes felt that way. Sometimes felt like, yeah, maybe maybe should have done this. Um, in some, 
I mean, there was, there's a, one, one paper where we actually had the exact same idea. I was like, oh, it feels you know, too similar to what we already did. It's not worth another paper. But then you know, somebody else did it and executed really nicely on it and had a lot of pick I'm like, oh, we could have done that and a lot of you know, interest in this work. But yeah, I mean, ultimately, it would have been an opportunity cost also, where we did other work in the meantime that we couldn't have done. Um, and so, yeah, I think maybe coming back to your original question, I think you kind of want to do something you're pretty uniquely qualified to do, most of the time at least. And then sometimes you may want to build up your qualification to be become uniquely qualified. That's something a little, a little new. Um, and so, I would say when we're doing the first papers on deep reinforcement learning, it felt like if we didn't keep pushing it, it's not clear how fast it would move. With this, it felt more like other people could build on it too. It wouldn't be easy, but it felt like there would be more critical mass of people who could build on it. Because um, the inverse neural formulations feel more clear cut. Back then, I mean, keep in mind, 2012, 13, 14, there was not even there was no TensorFlow. There's no PyTorch, like no Chainer. I mean, you had to pretty much do your your automatic differentiation wasn't that easily available. I mean, there was a lot of things people did not know about batch neural. I mean, people did not know about how to initialize neural nets. Like, there was so many things people didn't know that to get something working was actually so hard that it felt like that we were extremely uniquely qualified to keep pushing that. And I feel it's still reflecting what we're doing today. It also reflected in what happened after because after. After those results, more and more people joined the lab who said, hey, we actually also want to work in DeepRL and build more and more critical mass around that, make it even more uniquely qualified to solve some of those problems. Um, at this point, we've hit a point where the expertise is more spread out for sure. But at that time, it really felt like if we don't push it, well, I'm not sure how fast it's going to go. And it's nice to push something where you feel like you're going to be likely ahead. Yes? Uh, could you talk a little more about, I guess, your intuition of, let's say you're heading down a, a path that you're not so sure is going to work, but like, how long should you keep like, tackling that problem versus just dropping it and switching direction? Yeah, it's, it's hard to decide when it's time to give up. Um, I'll tell you a story about that on Thursday from my PhD, where after one year, I finally gave up on something. And then in three weeks, I solved the problem differently. So yeah, <laughs> I spent one year in the, on, the, on the path that I could have shortcut in a three-week uh, other effort. But so it definitely, I mean, I, I'm not perfect at deciding when to uh, switch. Um, I think a big part of it is to try to think about whether you're making, or making measurable progress. So. It's one thing to have a goal and not achieve it. Like, OK, maybe we wanted you know, policy gradients to solve Atari games. And for the longest time, that was just like the runtime would be too slow. We couldn't have fast turnaround experiments. It would never work anyway. And so we were not even close. But we were able to isolate the problem that is just pendulum and then later also card pole that are low dimensional easier to analyze. We know what optimal solutions look like. We know when we're getting closer. We can run so many experiments, so many random seeds, and we can see, OK, now our method succeeds maybe in 5% of the random seeds. Before, it was 1% of the random seeds. And we could actually see how to build that up to make things more robust. And so it felt like that entire year, there was continuous progress being made. It didn't feel like it was just like, we throw ideas into a black box, and it just comes back. And like It wasn't zero, one reward, let's put it that way. And it was always zero for a year and then one. It was very gradual progress over time. Progress in terms of better results. Sometimes progress in terms of things that we thought would work don't work. Uh, but we learn something. And so it's progress in our heads, in our understanding of the problem, what might or might not work, and how to deal with it. Um, yeah, I mean, for the trust vision policy optimization paper, initially we thought one of the big important things would be this idea called Vine, where when you collect your rollouts, you want to reset in states you visited before and take the other actions to see a branching happening, to get signal to noise, to understand which of those 10 actions available is the better one. Turned out it didn't matter at all. That took us a long time to, like, we hammered and hammered and tried, 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 because we thought that should be it, right? You get more signal from being in the same state twice, or more than twice, and seeing the different effects. But actually, that wasn't the case. More rollouts helps, but putting them from the same state doesn't necessarily help. 
Yeah, so I think it's all about breaking it down into gradual progress, where you say, OK, can I get this thing to work, or work better than I had it before? And essentially, whenever you're doing research, you're like, OK, what am I trying to do? I'm trying to get to a stable policy gradient method, let's say. right? So what is the smallest experiment that can run to get some learnings from that experiment? And I think that's really, I mean, ultimately, you could argue research is bottleneck by how fast you can code. But I would say if you're coding the wrong thing, then it doesn't really help you. And I would say it's even much more bottleneck by are you able to choose the right experiment that's the smallest experiment that allows you to learn something new. And then you can, from there, choose the next experiment, next experiment, next experiment. If you're really good at that, your research will go really fast. Because also those experiments will be faster to implement. You'll have very gradual progress, signal along the way, and be more easily on the right track. Yeah? What happens when you've been working on something for a long time, and then it just like doesn't work? Do you just, you just have to give up at that point? Um, let's see. If you've worked on something for a long time, it just doesn't work. You just give up. Um, I would say it's rarely happened that it felt like we just had to give up because we are always trying to go that gradual progression and learn lessons. And so as you learn those lessons, often what happens is you essentially change direction. You pivot. You say, OK, this is the direction I thought we were going to go. But actually, this finding suggests maybe we should go this other way. And so yes, you are, in some sense, giving up. But I wouldn't call it giving up, because it's not like you try something for a long time and it was all waste. It's more like you're making progress in a direction. You learn some lessons. You steer. And you go in a slightly different direction now. And that might happen many times. And at some point, you end up in a place where you're happy. You get some, ideally, somewhat unexpected results for the outside world. But for you now, make a lot of sense. I feel like those are the, the things you're striving for, right? You, you want to essentially. Find something that now to you makes a lot of sense. You had a hunch it would probably work and makes a lot of sense. But to the outside world, it would still be a bit of a surprise that that is actually true. So let me pick another paper. Oh, here, look at this one. Introduction to Statistical Relational Learning. This is a great way to get a lot of citations. You write a chapter in a book. So the way that, that often happens is somebody else is writing a book, or they've seen a new trend. So here, essentially, what was happening at the time, the paper that's effectively in here is this one over here, Discriminative Probabilistic Models for Relational Data. The paper I wrote as a master's student Ben Taskar was the PhD student who was my mentor at the time, Daphne Kohler, professor of the lab. And essentially, this was a direction that at the time saw a bunch of new work. There was a workshop organized around it. And then the organizers decided to bring a collection together of papers, re rewrite your paper as a chapter of a book instead of um, the original paper format, probably make, do a few additional experiments, a bit more context to it in the context of the book. And then all of a sudden, you get a lot of people to read it. Um, let's see. But circling back to the original paper itself, so what happened here is essentially at the time, and I think, I mean, of course, it's always going to be different. But at the, it's always about finding things that other people are not doing yet that you think are somewhat inevitable. Like when you say, like, this is for sure going to happen. Like, same with RL. For sure, the future of robotics will have successful RL in it. That was clear back then, even if we didn't know how to make it succeed yet. Um, same thing here. Machine learning at the time was all about you have some inputs. Let's say it could be an image, an output, some classification. Or input could be some text, an output, sentiment, or um, topic of the document, things like that. But the internet was just coming about, which was a new thing. And when machine learning could start pulling data from the internet, relational data. And so the idea was essentially Daphne's thinking at the time was, look, it's inevitable that we can do better by considering all the linked information. Like, obviously, it's also what Google uses and so forth. But essentially, the notion that if you look at words on a page that links to this page, let's say you want to know the topic of a given page, if you also look at pages that link to it, and especially the words on the link to that page might be extremely informative about that page. Same for the outlinks. It might be that it's very often that, and those are some of the examples in the paper, that often 
for university pages, because the internet had a lot of university pages at the time, often students will link to professors, professors link back to their students, and so it's very likely that <clears throat> if one page is a professor page, that the page they link to, even though it's just a name and the name doesn't give away whether it's a student or professor, but it's very likely it's going to be a student page. And so there's a relationship between these pages that you just know from the linking. If once you clearly know this professor, because it might say professor somewhere, and it goes to this other page, well, now it's likely, if it's a name, that this is a student page. And so that was kind of the inevitable thing Daphne saw in late 90s, early 2000s. She's like, OK, we need to lift the way we look at machine learning from just this kind of more insular one document at a time to seeing everything as linked and doing a joint inference over a whole set of pages, which is now called structure output prediction. So structured prediction problems is what essentially grew out of this original push. It's done differently now, of course. We're 20 years later. But that's essentially where this came from. If you can just leverage everything around you, you're going to inevitably do better. The other thing, what this paper was specifically about, there was already some work in that direction, was discriminative models. So at the time, there was a big kind of differentiation between generative models and discriminative models. Generative meant something like naive Bayes. You train a generative model for your data, and then you use Bayes' rule to figure out the class from the features. You can also do logistic regression, straight up discriminative. And so we looked at a way to doing discriminative learning over a joint set of outputs. So it's really the structure output prediction problem that um, looked at here. Now, the most highly cited paper in this direction was actually Ben's next paper, which unfortunately I was not involved in. <laughs> As you say, sometimes you're excited to be involved in the next paper, and sometimes you miss out on the next paper. But the next paper, I can probably pull it up. Um, Max Margin Markov Networks. So this paper was a NeurIPS paper. Um, and so this paper essentially did something very similar, but it used the support vector machine formulation into it rather than a probabilistic inference formulation. At the time, people did not fully appreciate yet the close connections between things like support vector machines, logistic regression, and so forth. But Ben and Carlos had seen those connections already before most people could see them, could see how they were there even for the structure output prediction case, and were able to essentially write a paper that shows that you can do this kind of joint inference over many, many variables, structure output prediction, using max margin formulation, which was the most, I mean, today people mostly don't use max margin. Back then, it was almost a religion. Like the way neural net makes you get a paper today, support vector machine would make you get a paper back then. And so when you switch from the kind of more logistic regression mark of random field framework at the time to a support vector machine formulation, which, by the way, was not, the insight was non-trivial at the time. I mean, it wasn't a, like everybody could just see it, oh, you just reformulate. It was a non-trivial insight to get this right and make it tractable and so forth. But it was also a sign of the times that the fact that that specific thing was figured out is what made it so popular. And so it was very clear at the time you made a support vector machine version of something that would be like essentially it was an oral at NeurIPS, maybe even best paper word I forgot. And there's only like 20 orals out of, you know, well, it's only once a year, 20 orals. So that's very selective. Um, and that, that was the follow-up paper there, or one of the follow-up papers, to, but the one that got maximum traction, I would say. Um, let's see. What else do we have? Actually, let's take a two-minute break. And after the break, we'll go through Maybe two more.
All right, let's uh, restart. Um, how about we pick the InfoGAN paper first? So InfoGAN, the idea there is to essentially, what was the state of affairs at the time? So you know, serial networks were starting to look very promising to generate images like real images. But the original motivation for doing unsupervised learning and generative modeling was to find latent representations that are meaningful, for which you can learn easily. And ideally, often that means you're looking for disentangled information, where maybe color and shape are disentangled, or for MNIST digits, maybe thickness of the pen stroke, tilt of the digit, and um, the digit number are decoupled, are living in separate variables. Now, why would that happen? Um, well, there's no reason to believe that that would actually happen automatically, because all you're training for is a way to represent um, these images. So Peter Chen, at the time, uh, went to a, actually information theory talk at Berkeley. And the talk uh, was discussing various aspects of entropy, independence of variables, mutual information, and so forth. And just sitting in that talk, he was just like, OK, it's obvious now. Like, If I can have high mutual information between the latent variables, the code, and my image that's generated, then that code is informative about the image, which is key. Then if in addition, I make those latent variables maximally independent while retaining that information, then as I'm trying to make them independent, the natural independent structure should emerge. So I said, I just need to train again where I make all the code variables independent, but make sure they retain the information. He set that up more formally with you know, mutual information, objective, and so forth. It kind of just worked. Um, and this was, I would say, this is one of those papers where sometimes you just, somebody just has the right idea, execute on it, it just works, because the idea is just really right, it's the right time, and, and it was a bit surprising how well it decoupled. I mean, it was clear it should be doing some decoupling. It was surprising that decoupling was so well aligned with what we think of as decoupling, that you know, latent variables corresponding to the digits. Uh, the numbers, right? Then latent variables corresponding to the slant, the thickness, and so forth. Um, so how well it worked was still a surprise when the experiments came out, but it was just like a very clear idea that was just turned around in probably order of a month or two months from just inception of idea to what became a um, invited, well, a paper at NeurIPS, but also an invited at the time. At that time, which obviously is not the case right now, but at that time, at NeurIPS, there was still something called Deep Learning Symposium. So after the main conference ended on Thursday, there were a few symposia. And it was a dedicated symposium to deep learning, because not everything was deep learning yet. Um, and now slowly, not everything is deep learning anymore either. But for a while, everything was deep learning. Back then, not everything was deep learning. It was a dedicated symposium to bring that work together. And essentially, it was just by invitation, what people thought were the 10 to 20 most interesting papers to get presented, and it got selected for oral presentation in that. So just like less than two months of work, and there it was. Um, so sometimes things can go very quickly, and there's no long story of working for a year with a, you know, a pendulum to finally get something working. It just you have the right idea, and that was Peter in this case, and he just made it happen. Um, then this one here, end-to-end -end training of deep visual motor policies. So what happened here is, now professor here, Sergey Levin, at the time, he just finished up his PhD at Stanford. And he came to Berkeley for a postdoc. At Stanford, he had shown that it is, he had developed this thing called guided policy search. What's guided policy search? We covered it in class with a quick recap. Essentially, the idea is that we do trajectory optimization to find good trajectories and feedback controllers along those trajectories. And then you essentially copy the controllers along those trajectories into a neural net that consolidates it all in one place. So the neural net imitates these optimal controllers that you found. That's guided policy search. Now, Sergey was the one who pioneered all of this. And he wanted to bring this onto real robots. First thing he did, he actually then learned the dynamics models 
from data collected on the real world, essentially doing a model-based RL version of guided policy search that worked really, really well. Next thing he said, well, this is not very satisfactory because also the robot needs to see, it needs to have a visual system. At that point, also Chelsea showed up. She started her PhD, so she was her first year PhD student at the time. Um, and the two of them started working together on this, and the main idea there was essentially the following. And it was kind of a new insight, which in, of course now everybody understands very well, but the notion that you could, in principle, and this was done, run trajectory optimization in state space. So you run trajectory optimization all in state space. But then the neural net that's going to learn to copy what those trajectory-based controllers are doing in different situations, that neural net does not get access to state. It only gets access to the image input. And so now you're forced to learn a vision-based controller, even though your examples are self-generated by effectively running trajectory optimization in state space. So you still need access to state space at training time. But at test time, you can now do vision-based control. And this was the first successful deep neural net um, learning for real robots vision-based control. Um, at least in the modern area, with I mean with RL, so that's that's really kind of the big thing and why the paper is cited so often. It's not necessarily about the very specifics of the approach because approach has always evolved. But it was essentially the first one to get it working on real robots with visual input, doing a wide range of tasks, not just this one thing, but a wide range of tasks. But this came really from a progression of Sergey working throughout his PhD going from trajectory optimization to guided policy search, all in simulation, then on real robots, then bringing in vision in a way that could actually be made to work at the time. Um, and so that, that's the story here. Let's see. When we discussed the relational data one. Benchmarking RL, deep RL for continuous control. So this is Rocky Duan started his PhD in when is this published? 2016. So he started his PhD in 2015. And at the time, TRPO had just come in place. Um, DQN was there. But also, there was not much else. It was DDPG was there. Um, there was some double DQN variants of DQN. And it was older approaches, like just straight up natural policy gradient, evolutionary methods, and so forth. And there was not a good understanding. Of, there was just a lot of like, OK, this paper claims it's doing well, but then this paper you know, claims they're doing better, and, but it's all both Cartpole or it's both 2D Walker. How come like, there was just a lot of discrepancies in experimental results. And part of it is because a lot of things had to be tuned up. The neural net architecture had to be tuned up, the learning rates, implementation could be a little bit off, and so forth. So Rocky decided to get some clarity. So he decided as he started his PhD, he wants to get clarity in the space. And he essentially decided, I'm going to benchmark uh, all the, at the time, most kind of dominant RL algorithms and see how well they can do on a fixed set of tasks. These were Majoko tasks that he standardized and that actually later when OpenAI, OpenAI started in January 2016. So Rocky finished this in fall 2015, submitted in January 2016. OpenAI started in fall in early 2016. One of the first things OpenAI then said is we should actually continue up on this benchmarking and then build OpenAI Gym on top of um, what Rocky had already built, of course, taking it to the completely next level. But the foundation here was that Rocky realized that there was a complete lack of clarity on how different approaches stack up against each other, and doing a very thorough comparison, and having reference implementations. So RL Lab, which came out of this, was the first set of reference implementations for deep RL algorithms. Also, at the time, DeepMind, and still mostly now, would never release their code. Um, and so anything that came out of DeepMind, somebody had to re-implement to be able to benchmark against it. And so RL Lab had a lot of that implemented, as well as the algorithms coming out of Berkeley and a few other places. Very thorough comparison. And that's what people kind of picked up on and then build off. Yeah, let me pause here again, see if there are questions about InfoGAN and um, benchmarking model-based, uh, benchmarking RL, deep RL. Yeah? Uh, so I used RL Lab. 
he still working on that, or is that is RL Lab not? So Rock, the question is, Rock is still working in RL Lab. Um, I would say RL Lab lives on in the next generations of code bases for RL, but Rocky is not actively maintaining RL Lab itself anymore. And so the, I would say, the places I would go look right now is probably two places. One is called Spinning Up um, by OpenAI, and that's a tutorial code base, where you have code and a tutorial that goes with the code. It's not the most optimized code for runtime and you know, efficiency and so forth, but it's most optimized for your learning. Looking at one algorithm at a time, clearly spelling out why every piece is there and what's happening with the code right there that you can also run. So that might be a natural starting point right now for code base. If you want something highly optimized, Adam Stuke, PhD student at Berkeley, he spend a lot of time building a highly optimized PyTorch implementation of most state-of-the-art, if not all state-of-the-art, deep RL algorithms. That's called RLPYT, so R-L-P-Y-T. And that's probably where I would go now if I wanted something that is optimized and I want you know, access to a range of algorithms, be able to run them easily. Yes? Uh, you mentioned about OpenAI started around that time the paper was published. And Historically, there has been very good synergy between them and, and the students in your lab. So how did that, uh, how did you build that synergy? So the question is, um, there's been a lot of synergy between OpenAI and Berkeley, especially students in my lab at Berkeley. And how, how did that grow? What's the dynamic behind that? So let me take a step back. Well, how did OpenAI come about? Right? And essentially, OpenAI started I believe early 2015, not as an as organization, but the kind of the seeds of the organization started early 2015. What happened at the time is there was a dinner with a bunch of renowned kind of Silicon Valley people, including Elon Musk, Sam Altman, and Greg Brockman. Greg Brockman at the time was CTO of Stripe. Stripe was doing really well at the time, and he's doing maybe even, I mean, it's continuing on that great path, it's doing really well now too. And and Greg was kind of, there was a lot of discussion about AI in that dinner. It was about, you know, what, you know, all about AI. And Greg concluded he was ready for a new challenge. Like, in some sense, Elon Musk, Sam Altman were kind of, you know, the domain, like, we should really do something. And Greg was like, I'm ready for something new. I want to dig into this. He wasn't an AI expert at the time, but you could see how important it was. He had built other systems, so he knew you know, he could probably build something new and he had led a big organization already. So he's like, OK, I want to dig into this and learn more. He started learning a lot about AI. He concluded that he wants to take this to the next level and really make this happen. This notion of a nonprofit that tries to ensure AI is built for good, not just for whoever who built it. So Greg wanted to make that happen at that point. Um, Greg then started asking around. And of course, it's, part of it is that it's very hard to make people move who are already at other companies and are happy. So a lot of focus ended up being on people who are about to graduate. So Greg tried to figure out who are the people who are about to graduate who are by and large considered leaders in the field. And the names that kept coming back were essentially then the names that became the founders of OpenAI. It was the founding researchers were John Schulman, came from Berkeley, Andre Karpathy from Stanford, Wojcik Zaremba from NYU, Dirk Kingman from Amsterdam, and ah, oh, I'm blanking on somebody here. Hmm. Yeah, one, one more. There's five founding researchers. And then, of course, founding research director, Ilya Sutskever, who they did manage to recruit away from Google at the time. And so part of why there's a very strong connection between Berkeley and OpenAI, especially at the time, is because John came out of Berkeley. OpenAI is very close to Berkeley. I mean, it's in San Francisco. It was clear a lot of interesting things were going to happen there. And so John you know, started telling us about a lot of the exciting things that were going to happen and how maybe there could be really good synergies that students spending some time there could be great for the students to get broader perspective beyond just the Berkeley perspective and could be great for OpenAI because, well, OpenAI is growing and wants to track the next generation, next generation of contributors. And so that's a lot where this came from in some senses. 
Like the fact that John Shulman co-founded OpenAI was the seed for the connection between Berkeley and OpenAI, and the proximity, I think, made it much tighter than any university has been. So I realize I skipped one paper here going down the list. Um, the MAML paper, Model Agnostic Meta-Learning for Fast Adaptation of Deep Networks. Um, so before I get into that one, I want to get into another one um, that's related, which is the RL squared paper. Where is that one? Let's see. Maybe it's just below the fold here. RL squared. So the story here is at the time, so this paper came out fall 2016. So essentially what happened is John Shulman had just graduated and co-founded OpenAI. Um, Rocky Duan had just finished the benchmarking paper and started thinking about, okay, we now know which RNs work well, but we also know certain problems are completely unsolvable by RL, and let's think about those. Um, kind of the main thing there was that it seemed the most important and biggest challenge essentially was to deal with long horizon problems. So we needed some hierarchical approach to reinforcement learning. That seemed like the clear cut hardest problem at the time. I would argue still today. Um, so this is, you say, you know, when do you switch, really switch directions? Rocky was going to take on hierarchical RL. John was working on hierarchical RL. They're working on it together. I mean, I was involved. Peter Chen was involved and so forth. Um, why hierarchy? Well, think about um, why it's unavoidable. Why do you need hierarchy? Well, think about a cleaning robot. At the lowest level, it controls itself at maybe 100 hertz just to make the motor spin at the right rate. But then above that, it's like deciding which direction to go. That might be at, I don't know, one hertz. Above that, it's trying to see where it even should be going. That might be at, I don't know, maybe every 100 seconds, it has to make a new decision about where really to go next, which room, and so forth. And then at the level above, it might decide it needs to go to a different building or go empty itself and so forth. And so if you think about it, if you're going to learn to maintain a whole, the cleanliness of an entire building by doing reinforcement learning at the 100 hertz level, you're never going to succeed. The credit assignment problem is too difficult. You need some abstractions on top of that to make it work. So hierarchy. So Rocky spent, and Rocky is super fast by the way. Like when Rocky spends a month on something, it's like a normal researcher spends something like 10 months on something. So Rocky spent something like six months on this, which is like six years for a normal person. Um, and still, it wasn't working. Like, it felt like it just things, he tried so many things, and so many things that we thought should work. And then they, uh, sometimes they give rise to hierarchy. But then it was hierarchy for hierarchy's sake. It didn't learn more quickly to solve a problem. Like, yeah, we got a hierarchy, but it's not quicker. And so after six months of doing that, essentially, um, Rocky said, you know what? Why do we even care about hierarchy? It's clear what we care about, even when we have hierarchy, that it learns more quickly. That's the final metric that we want. Why can't we just directly train for learning more quickly? So why can't we end-to-end -end train an agent that is trained to learn quickly? And whether it in, in on the inside figures out hierarchy or not, that's up to the agent. Give it a massive recurrent neural network, which in principle can have some things uh, change at low rate, some things at a faster rate. So it can have hierarchy if it wants to. It's completely free to do that. It doesn't have to. It's not needed for the problem. You can just set up a gigantic RNN and just train it to learn quickly to, let's say, solve new problems. And that was essentially the, the motivation behind RL squared. It was in some sense the change of direction. It was a hierarchy seemed the path to better solutions. 
we couldn't figure out in a half year stretch to get true tangible progress on the problem. But we realized that ultimately always we're asking the same bottom line question. And the reason we concluded we made no progress was not because we didn't have any hierarchy. There was hierarchy. It just wasn't helping the bottom line, which is faster learning. And then we said, well, if the bottom line is faster learning, we should just directly train end to end recurrent neural nets that are the brains of agents that will, when dropped in new environments, will start collecting reward after a very small number of episodes. And so that became RL squared. As that came out, at the same time, Chelsea here at Berkeley had also started to think about how to learn more quickly. How do you use past experience to learn more quickly in the future? She came from a very different angle. So Rocky came from the kind of end-to-end, -end, I want just this black box to learn faster in the future. I'm going to end-to-end -end train for that. Chelsea came from a bit more the kind of observation of what's happening in the current state of the art at the time. And this is the mammal paper. So she observed that what is so successful in computer vision is actually Pre, just pre-train on ImageNet, fine-tune on your own data. But that doesn't really work for behaviors. There's no ImageNet for behaviors. And it's not even clear that it is guaranteed to work. It could just, you just do something and you hope it works. At the same time, the ever more kind of prevailing paradigm was end-to-end -end training. What you should do is always train end-to-end. -end. Don't make it, you know, don't have something and then puzzle it together. Whatever you puzzle together, make it train end to end. So if we want something that is good at specializing to new things, we should be able to train end to end for specializing to new things. So train neural network ahead of time to be ready to be fine tuned with a few grand updates. Now, of course, then you still need to figure out how to make it actually work, how to implement that. Because now you're saying there's an inner loop of gradient descent. There's an outer loop, or outer optimization objective around that that's saying, if in the inner loop I do gradient descent, then the outer objective should succeed at optimizing my, my classifier very quickly for a new data set, or my RL agent for a new environment. Um, so this came out, well, the, she figured this out fall 2016. The paper came out in 2017. Now, one of the beauties here of this paper is that it, it's in the name also, model agnostic. It's essentially agnostic to the type of neural network. It's not committed to, let's say, an RNN or a feed forward network or maybe an attention network versus a combinant. It's agnostic to that. And the formulation is agnostic to the task. The same idea can be applied to reinforcement learning, which was our original motivation, but just as well be applied to supervised learning, to do few shot learning in supervised setting. And so that's one thing I would say that's always interesting to pay attention to. Um, even if RL is your ultimate goal and you want a better RL agent, if the idea you come up with is more general, and often it can be, it's good to keep that in mind and make your work much more general. Like one way to write this paper could have been to just write about RL because that was the original motivation, but that's actually not how the paper was set up. The paper was set up, look, this is completely general. And so people who now work on few shot learning for classification or few shot learning for unsupervised learning, few shot learning for RL, any one of those can effectively look at this paper for inspiration and build on it, um, which makes it much, have much more impact than if you keep it to one application domain that might have motivated you initially. Let me pause here again. Looks like we have time for one more. Let me see which one to pick. Um, everything helicopters will do on Thursday. Ah, this is, this, is, this is not a good example of how you might decide on writing a paper. So this is year is 2014-15. Um, this was a time when Compute had largely started to move into the cloud, but 
most robotics work that was done, people would still put a dedicated computer with each robot or even build a computer into the robot. Like, look at the PR2 robot, which came out in 2010. In the base of the PR2, there was a massive state-of-the-art compute of that time. But it was clear that a lot of things were, at the time, moving into the cloud, especially for training your robot. Um, you still need some compute close to not have too much latency. Otherwise, you know, it's going to take too long. You have too much latency, your robot's not going to succeed. Essentially, there was this at the time, and especially Ken was, was very much looking into that, Ken Goldberg, um, this notion that, you know, isn't it also inevitable that a lot of compute for robotics is going to shift to the cloud? And one thing is you're just thinking about shifting the compute, but it also means like shifting all the data that's collected into a central repository, shifting all the learning into a single place that can be shared across all robots. Maybe some robots need specialization, some don't. But this notion that it's not just about moving the computer, it's everything that comes with it. And really kind of writing out in a clear way what that trend is going to mean and surveying a lot of work that already existed but wasn't really necessarily using that terminology and bring it together and say, look, this is starting to happen here, there, and there. This is the trend. And this is how this can project into the future. And that's often very powerful because often things start happen in very many different places. But it's not always obvious to most people that there's a common pattern across all of them. And if you can bring that together and clearly articulate the pattern, it can be very powerful to kind of push the next generation of work forward. Cool. Maybe I'll, I'll stop here. Any more questions for today? Two quick logistical things. One is um, I'm going to send out a survey later today. Um, there are a lot of things that we changed in the class this semester from the previous offering. And so the survey is going to be largely focused. I'll have open-ended questions for anything you want to give feedback on. It's going to really, we're curious about feedback on specific all the things that changed. Things like a lot of the homework was redone, which also means that we can only roughly estimate how much time it's going to take. So we want to better understand how much time each homework has taken you, um, what the ratio of learning over time spent has been as you work through homework. Because ultimately, that's what matters. I mean, it's, if you spend a lot of time, that, that's justifiable if you learn a lot. It's not very justifiable if you feel like you're just doing it because you need it to complete the homework. And so we want to get a lot more insight into that, especially this year, because everything is very new this year. So I hope all of you can look at that um, and fill that out uh, so we can build on that for the next offering um, of the class. And then we have our last lecture on Thursday. On Thursday, what I plan to do is go through something a little similar today, but in a lot more depth on one specific project. So what I plan to do is to go through my PhD work on the Stanford Autonomous Helicopter Project and take you not just through the final things that worked, but also all the things that failed along the way and how we got to where we got in the end, but then also understand how it actually works um, and how it all uh, came together. Um, I think that's it for today. Thank you. See you on Thursday.